during these three Sunday mornings we are preparing our minds and hearts for Easter by studying Psalms 22, 23 and 24. If you missed last week's Psalm 22, I would suggest that you get hold of the tape so that you get the whole flow. These three psalms belong together. They are one psalm, really, in three parts. I have taken the liberty again of making a paraphrase of the psalm to bring out some of those hidden meanings in the Hebrew that we may miss in the English, and also to bring this psalm home to you with some freshness, because familiarity breeds contempt, and we may know these words too well and be able to recite them without understanding as we go. So let's read the paraphrase. I have just taken one word out of the sheet you have in front of you. Psalm 23. The only God who really exists, the God of the Jews, cares for me as an individual, like a shepherd for his sheep so that I'll never lack anything that I really need. He forces me to rest where there is abundant nourishment. Then he moves me on, making sure I have constant refreshment. He puts new life into me when I'm exhausted. He keeps me on the right track to maintain his good reputation. Even if I travel through a deep ravine where danger lurks in the shadows, I'm not afraid of coming to any harm because you are right there beside me with your cudgel to guard and your crook to guide. I feel quite safe. You lay the table for me in full view of my helpless foes. You treat me as an honored guest and put on a lavish spread. For the rest of my days, nothing will chase after me except generosity and loyalty. And I'll be at home with this God as long as I live. David's songs have been in the charts for 3,000 years now. Today is... Three years for a song would be quite a long time. Thirty years would be incredible. But for 3,000 years, these psalms have gone round the world and they are still sung by more people than any other songs that have ever been written. And of these songs, there is no doubt which has been at number one in the charts for a very long time. Psalm 23 is undoubtedly most people's favorite. I can understand why. For sheer literary quality, its beauty, its simplicity, its clarity, its brevity, it comes across as a masterpiece of literature. But the reason is deeper than that. It deals with the sort of experiences that life is made up of. It speaks to life. Life is made up of fears and of quiet times. It speaks about life. And it meets a very real response in the human heart. It has put more courage into human hearts than all the philosophies of the world put together. Which is probably the greatest reason why it's number one in the charts. It is a a song of tremendous consolation, of tremendous comfort. And we are going to draw that comfort this morning. It's inspired poets like Byron. It's inspired artists like Ruskin. And almost every century, someone translates this psalm into a hymn. In the 16th century, it was translated into The Lord's My Shepherd, I'll Not Want, which most of you know to Crimond. In the 17th century, The God of Love. In the 18th century, Jesus the Good Shepherd is. In the 19th century, The King of Love, My Shepherd is. In the 20th century, a pilgrim was I and a wandering. And if there's a 21st century, I'm quite sure somebody will rewrite this psalm and it'll be sung again. And it will go on being sung until history ends. Now, like Psalm 22, it's full of animals. 
though this time all the same animal. Sheep this time. Last Sunday morning we looked at bulls, goats, dogs, a hind, a worm. This week it's just sheep. David saw a lot of human truth and even divine truth in animals. Why? Why, because God made the animals and the world is one universe and it all belongs together. And in fact, from the animals you can learn a great deal about yourself and about the Lord. That's why he's called, our Lord Jesus is called a lion and a lamb, as well as in Psalm 22, a hind and a worm. But in this psalm, you are called sheep, which is a title never given to our Lord Jesus. He's the shepherd. He was never a sheep. But I'm afraid you are and have been sheep. So have I. We live in a country with many sheep, so we understand something of all this. Australia, New Zealand are in a similar situation. But I want to make quite clear at the beginning of this psalm that however much you've seen of sheep in this country, that will not help you a great deal when studying this psalm. Because looking after sheep in England and looking after them in Palestine is a totally different task. Oh, they're much the same animals, yes. But there are at least four major differences which I want to highlight, which I've shared with you before when we went through this psalm before. But let me just repeat this part. First of all, a shepherd's life out there is much more difficult. They don't have fields full of grass into which they can turn the sheep. The fields are kept for corn or for vines and the sheep have to be taken miles and miles wandering over the hills looking for a bit of something to eat and something to drink. They travel up to 15 miles a day and the shepherd has to walk with them all the way. That doesn't happen in England. And secondly, a shepherd's life out there is much more demanding in the sense that it's a 24-hour job. He has to watch over his sheep not only by day, but by night. He lives with them, eats with them, sleeps with them. And in fact, that little carving down there, carved out of a solid piece of olive wood, came from just near the shepherd's fields in Bethlehem. I want you to come and look at it afterwards. I want the Holy Spirit's fire just to light up that for you and show you the shepherd and the sheep. There's a shepherd just lying down, watching his sheep by night, resting with them. It speaks of the terribly close relationship between them. Thirdly, they are therefore much more devoted to the sheep than we are in this country. I've been a shepherd and we look after sheep, but we had uh, something like 600 and you don't get to know them too well. You know the eccentrics among them fairly quickly. But uh, it takes a long time to know them. And the elder leading this service, I was so thrilled to discover just this last week that he too has had experience of looking after animals on farms. And I'm so glad he has. Sometimes the Lord chooses leaders for his flock who've looked after animals because this is a preparation. And he told me that it took him some weeks to begin to get to know sheep as individuals and he was just getting to know them when he had to leave them. And a shepherd out there knows them very intimately because they are kept not for meat but for wool and he stays with them a long time. He has a small flock, maybe just 10 or 15. He calls them by name. He calls them short ears, long legs, black face and they know their name and when he calls their name they come. In other words, the relationship between a shepherd and a sheepdog in this country is much nearer the relationship between a shepherd and a sheep out in the Middle East. If you've had the privilege of watching the National Sheepdog Trials on television recently and seen the relationship between a man and his dog, his control of the dog, the dog's response to him, the pat on the head at the end of the way, you've got the relationship much more clearly than if you simply watch a herd of sheep being pushed along a country lane, being chased by a lot of sheepdogs. And finally, in the Middle East, a shepherd's life is a good deal more dangerous than here. In fact, somebody who visited that land about a century ago came back and said when he f met his first shepherds, he was shocked. He thought he was looking at brigands. They had pistols, 
clubs, axes, and I don't know what else. They looked like brigands because they had to be fighters and they knew that they had to risk their lives for the sheep to bring that flock safely home at the end of the day. They would have to fight their way through. Now all of that is strange to a shepherd in England and yet there are other things which are similar which will come out. Like Psalm 22, the 23rd Psalm is in the first person singular, but this time it is as real in fact as in feeling for the writer because David had been a shepherd. He's drawing on past experience. Psalm 22, we saw that he had this miraculous feeling without facts. He felt about things that had never happened to him, but now he's feeling about things that had happened, only he'd been on the giving end, not the receiving end in his previous experience. He was a shepherd boy when God said, I want you as the king of this nation. I want you to shepherd these people. So it's autobiographical. You almost might call it a day in the life of a shepherd. As a king, David shepherding the nation was writing as a sheep. And the only true shepherds there can ever be for people are those who still admit that they are sheep. And as soon as those who are called to shepherd God's flock begin to think of themselves as having ceased to be sheep, then they will get into serious trouble. Even the pastors, elders, shepherds of God's flock on earth are still sheep, whereas the good shepherd never was one. Now let's take a fresh look at the Psalms. That's why I've written the paraphrase. To some it will have been sacrilege to touch the authorized version. But at some points the authorized version is misleading both in its wording and therefore in its application and your understanding. There are some words in the authorized version that are not there in the original and shouldn't have been put in. And it has alas led many people off track in applying this to themselves. Nobody likes their illusions shattered, especially our cherished beliefs in religion. This provides us with our security. Yet I believe that we gain rather than lose by facing the truth and reality. So I'm going to tell it as it is, even if I'm afraid some cherished notions suffer. They will be replaced by some more beautiful thoughts for you. And here are the first two things I want to say <clears throat> to clear up misunderstandings. Number one, this parable, sorry, this psalm is not for death but for life. That's the first. It is not for those who are dying. It is for those who are living. And the second thing I want to say is this psalm is for sheep and not for goats. An obvious thing but I want to say it. Take the first. It is not for death, it is for life. I know it's the favorite song for funerals. I know that many people, famous people, like Sir William Hamilton, for example, died with the words of this psalm on their lips, saying, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I know that St. Augustine said, This is the psalm for Christian martyrs. And many Christians have gone to their death singing this psalm. An outstanding example in this country would be the two 20-year-old girls who were hung in Edinburgh because they were Christians and they were hung singing Psalm 23. I know all that. But I believe this psalm is primarily for the crises of life and not just the final crisis. It is of more help to you now than when you're on your deathbed, if you understand it truly. You see, one reason why we apply it to death is that in the authorized version, the word death was put into the psalm, and it's not there. It's, yea, though I walk through the valley of deep darkness, I will fear no evil. And you can walk through that valley tomorrow morning without dying. And it's also due to the inclusion of the words at the end of the psalm, forever, making it a reference to the future life. 
But in fact, if you've got a Bible with marginal references in, you'll notice at the bottom it says Hebrew, as long as I live. Now, Christians can read eternity into that, but for David, he was talking about as long as he lived here. So this psalm is to help you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, next week, however near your death or far from it you are. It's a psalm for life and not for death. And secondly, it's a psalm for sheep and not for goats. I mean by that far too many people sing this who have no right to. Again, we've been misled by the English translation which has the Lord is my shepherd. You'll notice the word Lord is usually in capital letters indicating that there's something unusual about that word and that is not the word in the original. And your Bible will tell you that that word L-O-R-D in capital letters in the Old Testament has been slipped in for an unpronounceable word which is not a description or a title, but a name. In English, Jehovah, in Hebrew, Yahweh. And David is not saying, God is my shepherd. If that's what he said, then everybody can claim the psalm because everybody has one God, the God who made them. But the name indicates a particular God the God who gave his name, Yahweh, which means I am, I really exist, that God and that one only is referred to in this psalm, and he is the God of the Jews, and there is no other God who exists, and the name of every other God in the world is I am not. And so the first verse says, Yahweh is my shepherd, I am is my shepherd, the God who really exists is my shepherd, the God of the Jews is my shepherd, and until a man knows the God of the Jews, he can't claim the rest of the psalm. You with me? It's not a psalm for general mankind. It's for a psalm who've got to know, for those who've got to know a particular God with a particular name. And if you haven't got that first phrase, the rest of the psalm is wasted on you, it's more than wasted. It will delude you into a false sense of security. The relationship in verse 1a is the condition for everything else. And without that, the whole thing falls to the ground. This particular God of all the gods in the world, Allah, the God of the Muslims, his name is I am not. And I gave him that name. All the gods of the Hindus in India, every one of them, their name is I am not and I give them that name. There's only one God whose name is I Am, and I Am is my shepherd. Now that's where we begin. So it's for sheep and not for goats, and before we claim the promise, we must be aware of the presence. Before we claim the benefits, we must be aware of that blessing. Now if you're going to be a sheep, one of the sheep, then that's going to involve two things. First of all, that you admit you are a sheep. That's quite an admission. You know, human beings in the Bible are described in many terms. Some are called wolves in sheep's clothing, but still wolves. And Jesus called Herod a fox. And in Psalm 22, men were called bulls, lions, dogs. But who likes to call himself a sheep? I mean, these others at least have some virility, some aggressiveness about them, some life in them. But you say to someone, you're sheepish, and see what their reaction is. It's not a compliment. And so the first step in claiming this psalm is to say, Lord, I'm a sheep, and I need a shepherd. Do you know that's very hard for a mature man to say? It's easier for little children to say. That's why children's missions are fruitful. It's easier for elderly people to say, I need a shepherd. It's easier for women than men to say, I need someone to lead me. But for a mature man to say, I'm a sheep and I need a shepherd, is quite an admission. And until you've admitted it, you can't claim this psalm. And David wrote this at the height of his maturity when he could have said, as most men in this world say, I can manage my own life. 
I don't need anyone else. I'll sort out my own problems. But he didn't. He said, I'm a sheep. I need a shepherd. Even though he'd reached the top of his career, if you like, even though he was the top man in the nation, even though he was the king of Israel, I'm a sheep and I need a shepherd. That's the first step. Well, what is sheepish about men? One thing very simple. Isaiah 53 says it. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. That is precisely what makes you a sheep, that you go your own way. And that's precisely what gets you into trouble and why you need a shepherd. If you do your own thing, you'll need a shepherd very quickly. If you plan your own life, you'll need a shepherd. If you try to sort out your own problems, you'll need a shepherd. But we go our own way and we stray, just like sheep. The fact is we need both provision and protection, whether we admit it or not. It is beyond a man to know when, when to rest, when he needs to rest. And I speak from bitter experience. It is beyond a man to keep his soul in good condition. He needs someone to restore it. It is beyond a man to get through the valley of the shadow without being overcome by evil. It is beyond a man to walk in the paths of righteousness. He needs a shepherd. And until he admits it, he doesn't have one. And the second thing that is implied in this first part of the psalm is not only that you've admitted that you're a sheep, but that you're confessing that you found the shepherd. Not that you're a seeker, but that you found. Do you remember Psalm 22 said seekers will become singers? Well, this psalm is not a psalm for seekers. It's a psalm for singers who found and who are able to say the Lord is my shepherd. I'm not hoping he's going to be. I'm not trying to find him. He is my shepherd. Is, that's the present continuous tense right now. And that's where we begin. And I've spent so much time on just the first five words and I'm going to spend another five minutes on them yet. Because if you're not with me in these first five words, you might as well think about the football match yesterday or the dinner in the oven at home. Use your left hand and just put the words on it. The, the. You've only one thumb on that hand. It's unique. The. One thumb, four fingers. The. There's only one God. He's unique. I am. Lord. Remember the name. You can point to him one way. Point to that person. There's only one. We point to him this morning. Yahweh, Jehovah, the God who really exists, the God of the Jews. Is, tallest finger, and therefore the most important thing in a sense, that your present relationship is there. My, that personal finger, they used to believe that a nerve went from that finger up the arm to the heart and so when we put a wedding ring on, we put it on that finger to surround that finger with a love that has no end. My. Shepherd, the smallest finger, did you know that the shepherd was the lowest socially, disregarded by all other callings? If you wanted to insult someone, you called them a shepherd. A shepherd was the very bottom, the smallest in society. And think of the contradiction. The Lord is my shepherd. The great God came to the bottom of the social scale to look after me. And you've got it all. Do you know many, many years ago, two ministers, two church ministers, went for a holiday together hiking through the mountains of Wales. And right up there in the mountains, they came across a little Welsh boy who was looking after some sheep. And they began to talk to this Welsh boy and they discovered that he could neither read nor write. One of the ministers pulled out of his pocket a little New Testament and read to him this psalm because he thought he'd be interested. And the boy was captivated. So they explained to this boy and they tried to help him to memorize the psalm but he couldn't even memorize that so they just taught him the first five words on his left hand as I've just taught you. 
Many years later, those same two ministers went hiking in the same area, and it was a hot summer day, and they were very thirsty, and they went to a cottage, and they knocked at the door, a woman answered, and they said, would you please make us a cup of tea? We're willing to pay for it, but we're so thirsty. Would you make a cup of tea? And she said, I'm not going to charge you. Come in. And took the two in. When they got in, they noticed on the mantelpiece a picture of a boy. And they recognized the boy they'd talked to. And they said, we've met that boy before. And she said, yes, he's dead. Oh, she said, it was a great tragedy. There was a blizzard. And the boy went out to see that his sheep was safe. And he fell over a cliff, down a precipice, came to rest on a ledge still alive. But they didn't find him until too late and he was frozen to death. And they said when they found him, his right hand was holding that finger so tight that they could not separate the hands. They buried him like that. The Lord is my, my shepherd. And until you've got that kind of tight hold on the only God who exists, then don't you dare to claim anything else in this psalm. But when you've got that tight hold, then everything else follows. Actually, I said that you have to have found a shepherd, you know, but really every Christian will tell you it was the shepherd who found me. He went looking for me. But it's the same thing, we found each other. When I first read these words, the Lord is my shepherd, do you know what question flashed into my mind? The Lord is my shepherd, who's yours? That was the question that came. Who's yours? Some people would say, myself, I'm my own shepherd. I trust in my own knowledge, my own skill, my own money. I'll see me through. Some people say someone else. My wife, my husband, my business partner, my friend, they'll see me through. Some people point to a corporate body and say the trade union will look after me and my family. The welfare state will look after me. And some people talk of other gods, Allah and many other gods, and say he look after me. And some people even say the church is my shepherd or the pastor is my shepherd. I'll be looked after at Millmead. None of those is what the psalmist says. The Lord is my shepherd. Whose is yours? Whose is yours? Because you see, all these other shepherds leave you sooner or later. They've got to. That's life. There's only one shepherd who can really see you right through. And so we begin with the true shepherd. Verse 1, I've called his decision because behind it lies a decision to trust as a mature man to trust the shepherd that's the biggest decision a man can ever make. And I would say that the Lord is my shepherd was David's creed. Long before any other creeds were written, I think that was his creed, the Lord is my shepherd. If you'd asked him what you believe, he would say, I can tell you in five words, the Lord is my shepherd. But the true shepherd involves a trusting sheep. A sheep that has pinned his hopes to one person sheep that puts his whole future in the hands of one person. That's what gives this strong sense of security. I shall not want. Now there's a phrase that's out of date. The ancient meaning and the modern meaning of the word want are so different that you could so misunderstand this phrase. The word want today means desire. I want this. I want that. I want the other. And it doesn't say the Lord is my shepherd. I can have everything I want doesn't say that, doesn't promise affluence, doesn't promise luxuries. The ancient meaning of the word want was need and therefore I've expanded it. I'll never lack anything that I really need. This is the answer to covetousness. Covetousness and contentment are the two main attitudes in life. You'll meet a lot of covetous people as you go through life. You'll meet some content people as you go through life. And the most content are those who say, the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. Meaning, I'll, I'll not need anything. 
He may not give me luxuries, but I'll never lack necessities. Or as one girl in a Sunday school reciting it to her teacher, got it rather wrong, but got it right, said, the Lord is my shepherd, that's all I want. And that's real security, real security. So now let's move on to verse 2, which I've called his dependence. It's a very tender verse, the needs of the sheep are the cares of the shepherd, and also the skill of the shepherd, his thoughtfulness in planning ahead. The shepherd has to plan that route to get them to green pastures and still waters. He's got to know where they are. He's got to have explored first. He's got to take them where he's been. And that's the sheep security that the shepherd has already been there and knows the way ahead and has planned the route. Now, food and drink are not easily found out there. That's why they travel up to 15 miles a day. But sheep must not be rushed. That's why if you've watched the sheepdog trials, you notice constantly the shepherd is telling the dog to slow up. To rush the sheep will get them into a bad condition, into panic. They'll do silly things. They must be gently walked on. Sorry if I get excited about this, but sheepdog trials are fascinating. You must go and watch some if you've never been to see them. Lie down, lie down, to bring them on. Sorry, I'm going to start using the old terms I used to use. <laughs> Up in North, we used to say, how am I, Ben? Come on, Bess, come on, Bess. And, and you control the dog so the sheep just walk. Now, a good shepherd knows that he's got to keep the sheep's life in balance. When a sheep loses its balance, it's in serious trouble. You know, when I preached on John chapter 10, the good shepherd, I got a letter from a shepherd afterwards, maybe here this morning for all I know, and he shared with me two experiences he'd had in the previous week, which I'll share one this week and one next Sunday. He says, these are two thoughts really arising from two heavily in lamb ewes. The first ewe was over on her back, helpless, partly held by the size of her abdomen. As I turned her over, I held her steady before she ran off so she could reorientate herself. Previously, I've seen sheep stagger and fall down before regaining their balance. It helped me to realize how we need to stop and get our balance right when Jesus sets us back on our feet. I'm preaching to myself as well as you this morning. The balance between eating and drinking and the balance between resting and activity. How important it is for sheep to get the balance right. And you notice how they're linked. Eating is linked with resting and activity is linked with drinking. And indeed, if you're going to digest your meal properly, you should rest over it. And the shepherd knows this balance, and yet he's got to take those sheep 15 miles. So the skill of a shepherd in the Middle East is to know when to make them lie down, when to move them on, where to take them. It's, it's a highly skilled business. And so he makes them lie down in green pastures where they can both relax and be nourished plenty of green grass for them. When does he do that? He does that at noon. If you read the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 7, you'll find there that it says, Where will my beloved lay down with his flock at noon? You see, at noon, midday, that's when the heat is on. And many sheep would foolishly go on wondering in that heat, but the shepherd knows that noon, midday, is the time for them to relax and rest. I'm going to be very bold and say, I think that's equivalent to middle age. And to keep up the pace in your 20s when you're in your 40s, he may not want that. He forces us to rest. He makes us lie down. Just get nourished. But then he doesn't want you to settle down in middle age for the rest of your life and do nothing more. Then he moves us on. And he always leads us by still waters. I don't know if you've ever studied a sheep, but its nostrils are next door to its mouth, much closer than mine are. They're together. 
and a sheep can't drink from running or tumbling water. It has to have a well or a trough or a pool. Still water. The shepherd knows exactly what kind of refreshment the sheep needs and where to find it. And while he's moving you on, he'll see that you get just the right kind of refreshment. Isn't it lovely? Each detail just is so full of meaning. I can't stop to draw out the total meaning except to say that to the Christian, pastures inevitably brings Scripture to mind and pool inevitably brings the Holy Spirit to mind, a spring of living water. Somewhere between the pasture of the Scripture and the pool of the Spirit, the Christian will be balanced by the shepherd and the shepherd is responsible for getting the sheep back in balance and holding it steady until it's on its feet again. Verse 3, his development. I'm sorry, it's going to be another marathon this morning. We're not getting on, are we? Verse 3, it's development, his development. Sheep must be kept healthy, they must grow, they must mature. And the result of the balance in verse 2 is not exhaustion, but energy. Energy. And so he restores my soul. Now the word soul is misleading because we think of the soul as the spiritual part of us. But look, animals are souls in the Bible. In Genesis 1, the animals are described as living souls. In Genesis 2, God breathed into the dust and man too became a living soul. And soul here means life, energy, movement. He restores my soul doesn't mean that he makes me spiritual again. It means he puts life back into me. He gives me energy again. But energy without direction is harmful. I must not only have energy, I must know how to expend it. It must be channeled. If it goes into the wrong channel, it's harmful. And so immediately he says he restores my soul. He puts new life into me. He says also then he directs that energy into the right channel. He leads me in, in the right track. The word is track, and a track is very narrow, so narrow. Have you seen a sheep track? It's not a road, it's not a highway, highway. And the good shepherd will lead you in a narrow track because it leads to life. If you get sheep, they will inevitably go for the broad gap and not the narrow one. That's one of the problems. Have you seen the final triumphant conclusion of a sheepdog trial? Getting them into that pen... Not just where they've got a gate to swing and a bit of rope and a, sh a crook that extends the barrier, as it were, about 20 feet, but when there are just five gates with a narrow opening and they've got to get them through. Sheep will always take the broad opening. They'll never take the narrow. That's one of the problems with sheep. And Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to life and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And he'll get me into that narrow track because it leads to life. Why? Because his reputation as a shepherd is at stake. In the sheepdog trials, it's not the dog that gets the credit, it's the man. The dog gets some, but it's the man whose name is at stake. And that man puts everything he's got into that sheepdog trial because he knows perfectly well that if his dog makes a mess of it, he will get the blame. And it is his reputation, his name, his honor that is at stake. And Jesus... The good shepherd will get us into those tracks any way he can so that he keeps up his good name as a good shepherd, as a righteous shepherd, as a holy shepherd. Let's move on. It's his responsibility and his reputation. Verse 4, David talks about his defense. So far, reasonably pleasant circumstances, but the Bible is honest. It's not all up on the hilltops. There are deep valleys to go through. A sheep has no insurance against hazards. And now a harsher note creeps in. Enemies, evil. We live in a world with enemies. We live in an evil world and the sheep have to travel through it. And you would understand this if you saw the country around Bethlehem. You'll know that to get to the green pastures, to get to the still waters, the sheep have to be taken through deep gorges. And there in that place... In the Bible days, there were lions, bears, hyenas, leopards, jackals. They lived down in the Jordan jungle. The Jordan Valley was jungle in Bible days, and that's where these wild beasts lived, and they came up into the hills at night looking for food, and the shepherds were watching their flocks by night to prevent it. 
The critical times for the valley of the shadow were early morning and late afternoon when the sun was dropping, the shadows were deep. For these creatures came out at night and so at either end of the night, in the early morning and late afternoon, they were lurking in the shadows. And to get to the pastures, the shepherd had to travel through those gorges and the sheep had to go through them too. And the Bible never promises an easy passage. There will be crises. And I'm going to press this day in the life of the shepherd a bit further. The valley of the shadow could be early morning and late afternoon. It could be in your teens as you're setting out to look for life. It could be in your fifties and sixties as the afternoon twilight begins on your life. These are critical periods critical periods, as many will testify. For the valley of deep darkness is not the valley of death. Thank God John Bunyan realized this when he wrote the Pilgrim's Progress. He put the valley of the shadow in the middle of Pilgrim's life and not at the end when he died and crossed the Jordan, but right in the middle. You can go through the valley of the shadow while, while you're riding on a tube train. When you're in the bank, when you're watching television, you can go through the valley of the shadow. It's the valley where evil lurks in the shadows. And the sheep has to go through it. It fears evil, not death, evil. And a rod and a staff are no use to a dying sheep. This is not death. This is life when the pressures are on. The place of moral darkness can happen anywhere, but there are those danger times, I believe, particularly setting off in the morning and coming home at night when Satan can be very real. Two things give the sheep courage, the presence of the shepherd and the protection of the shepherd. And like Nehemiah's workman, the shepherd had a tool in one hand and a weapon in the other. A cudgel, which was a piece of wood with a big knob at the end, and a crook, a long stick with a curve at the end. Archbishop, the Westminster Roman Catholic Archbishop, was enthroned this week and was given the most gorgeous crook with beautiful, elaborate gold curve at the top. I just found myself wishing that someday a bishop would be given just a plain, ordinary, wooden shepherd's crook just a piece of wood with a curve. Two bits of wood, one is a tool, one is a weapon. The tool is a deadly instrument, it's weighted at the end and it's used at close quarters. When a wild animal has grabbed a sheep, that is brought down on its skull so that it drops its victim. And the crook is used to catch hold of the sheep by the neck and pull it back into line. In the Lord's discipline is our security. And I'm not afraid. The cudgel. If I'm grabbed by the enemy, Jesus will knock him on the head. And if I'm just getting a bit too far away from the shepherd, his crook yanks me back in. May hurt a little at the time, but it's good for me to be got back into line close to the shepherd. So the disease of fear is cured, even in the valley of deep darkness. Verse 5, his delight. Now this short psalm is a mixed metaphor. And mixed metaphors are bad English, but God is not English. <laughs> and the Bible is not afraid of mixed metaphors. Jesus said, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. There's another truth from the animal world for you. But a mixed metaphor. And you know, David couldn't keep this meta metaphor up because he's dealing with human beings. And while they are like sheep, they are not sheep. And so the metaphor gets all mixed up here. The comparison between animals and humans breaks down because the Bible says we're only like sheep. And the picture turns from out of doors to indoors, from a sheep to a guest. In fact, from now on, the sheep is treated like a shepherd. Have you ever heard of a sheep sitting at a table drinking from a cup inside a house? No, the metaphor has changed. 
And David has just had to burst out of it because he's a human being and he's more than a sheep. He's more than a sheep. Yet it's still related to verse 4 because the enemies are still around. There's a continuity of theme even if the metaphor's changed. But now his enemies are beaten, licking their wounds, looking on amazed. Because he is not only now being treated like a shepherd, he is being treated by the shepherd. And the shepherd is spreading a table. And those enemies, beaten, bleeding, licked, are looking on, amazed. And quietly the shepherd's spreading the table. And it's a picture now of Eastern hospitality. And you've got to understand Eastern hospitality to appreciate this verse. The two things that you do with a guest if you've invited him to a meal, or the three things. First, you get the best meal you can ready for him. That's step number one. Second, when he arrives, you brill cream his hair. That's the nearest modern equivalent I could get, but I didn't dare to put it in the paraphrase. <laughs> but literally, they would anoint their hair with oil to make it smooth, shiny, and smell nice. They didn't do it themselves before they came. It was the host's job, and it still is in the East, to spruce up his guest. We just say, would you like to go and wash your hands? But then they said, I'll anoint your head. And the third thing you do is to give him a drink before the meal, which is still done today. But to show real hospitality, you went on pouring till it ran right over the top. It was a gesture saying, I'll give you all I can. And here's the sheep sitting at the table with the wolves looking on. And the shepherd is laying a spread, smoothing his hair down, filling a cup to the brim. How does the sheep feel now? It's a lovely picture, isn't it? That's how you feel when you come out of the valley of the shadow. You come out of the gorge to gorge yourself. <laughs> you come to a feast after the fight. And that's why the metaphor changes. What a delight it is. Verse 1, he says, I'll always have necessities. Verse 5, he says, luxuries brimming over. Now, finally, verse 6. His destiny. The final verse puts both metaphors together. The pictures get mixed up again. There's a fleeting glance back at the sheep and at the guest. And in the first half of the last verse, you've got a sheep. In the second half, you've got a guest. And he puts it all together in one glorious thought with Hebrew parallelism, which means that their poetic form was to repeat the same thought in other words. And so he looks forward to two things. And there's a paradox here because he's mixed the metaphors. He's outdoors and indoors at the same time. He's walking along the road and he's sitting at the table at the same time. And these are two aspects of the Christian truth. You can never contain the whole of the Christian experience in one metaphor. So look at the first part. He looks forward to peaceful days. All his days, not just some of them, all the days of my life, the bright ones and the dark ones, all the days of my life. What's going to happen? He's going to be chased. Now, you know, the sheep is not basically aggressive. The sheep's instinct is always to run. They are easily chased. Anything can chase them. They instinctively run and panic. And so sheep are forever looking around and tense if there's something else around, ready to run. They expect to be chased. They have no real defense. They have no sharp fangs. A few rams are an exception, but most sheep just can't defend themselves. They run. So they're always being chased. And literally, the Hebrew word is not follow, but chased. And the word surely is not the word surely, but the word only. I'm sorry to destroy all these illusions. But he's saying this. All the days of my life, the only things that will ever chase me will be goodness and mercy. A schoolboy once wrote for his RE lesson that the names of God's sheepdogs were goodness and mercy. <laughs> I like that. Chased by goodness and mercy. You don't run from those two things. 
you let them catch you. Only goodness and mercy will chase me all the days of my life. The word goodness, however, means generosity. It means someone near me who will just go on giving and giving and giving. I'm not going to run away from someone who's going to keep giving to me, are you? Not on your life. The word mercy is a lovely Hebrew word, cheseth, which means loyalty, steady support, sticking to someone through thick and thin. It's the word that is used of marriage. It's the words that's used so often of God for his people. It's often translated loving kindness or mercy. But it, I think loyalty conveys the heart of that word, loyalty. Well, with generosity and loyalty chasing you, who's going to run? <laughs> Not me. That's the sheep. Now the guest. And I'll be at home with this God as long as I live. The Hebrew words are not forever, but as long as I live. It's, it's a parallel to the first part. He's talking about the rest of his life. All my days, as long as I live. And he says, on the one hand, goodness and mercy will chase me, and I'll let them catch me. And on the other hand, I'll never be without a home. I'm going to live with God. Now, David wrote this psalm at a time which ended the period when David himself was hunted, when his own son tried to seize the throne and David went into hiding and he hid in the dark valleys of the shadow down by En Gedi, by the Dead Sea. And David had been hunted and hounded, but one day he came back to Jerusalem to stay. And he knew he was there for the rest of his time. And he said, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord. I'm going to live with God for the rest of my life. He was thinking of a particular building, the temple, he lived right next door to it. His palace was almost part of it. I'm going to live there. For us, there is no literal temple on earth where we can go and say that's where God lives. In the New Testament, we are told you are the temple of God. You are. And so the Christian, even while he's traveling the road as a sheep, is dwelling in the house of the Lord at the same time. For he is the house of the Lord. He's at home with God. You may not have a house, but you will never lack a home. For the Lord will be your dwelling place through all generations. So that's how he finishes. What a triumph and conclusion. As a sheep, he'll only be chased by generosity and loyalty. As a guest, he hasn't come to visit the house of the Lord and sit at his table. He's come to stay. Unbelievers only visit the Lord from time to time when they're in an emergency. Believers live with him and they stay with him for the rest of their lives. In conclusion, there are three things missing from this psalm. Did you notice? Three things not there that should be? Well, because they're not here, they're somewhere else in the Bible but I want to mention them. It's not surprising in six verses that you miss something out, is it? Well, what, what are these three things? Number one, the relationship of the sheep with each other. No mention. But that's a very important part. If you're going to follow this shepherd, you'll be with other sheep. When Peter responded to Jesus' call, follow me, I'm afraid his brother Andrew came along too. They were so different. When James responded to the good shepherd's call, follow me, John came along too. They had to learn to live together. And when sheep are infighting, their danger is much greater. And Jesus, the good shepherd, on the night before he died, said, I want you to love one another. There must be peace among my flock. There must be harmony. There mustn't be backbiting. You must follow me together. And some of the sheep he even entrusts with the task of helping him to care for the others. To Simon Peter he said, Fee feed my sheep. And Simon Peter later said to elders in a church, tend the flock of God. Our relationship to each other as sheep is not here which may be why people outside the church like this psalm, because it doesn't challenge them about their relationships to the flock. 
The second thing that's missing here is the responsibility of the sheep to the shepherd. It's all he leads me, he'll look after me, he'll keep me safe. It's all about the responsibilities of the shepherd. But there are responsibilities of the sheep and they are there implicitly if not explicitly. And the responsibility of the sheep is to feed when he produces the green pasture. It is to follow when he leads. It is to feast when he lays the table. He doesn't do everything for us. The sheep must follow. And the sheep must feed. And the sheep must feast. He provides and protects. But he doesn't want you doing nothing. The responsibility of the sheep to the shepherd is there implicitly. Above all, are you willing to walk in righteousness? We'll look at that next week with Psalm 24. Who will go up into the hills with this Lord? Clean hands, pure heart. Next Sunday. The third and last thing that is missing from this psalm is the readiness of the shepherd to die for the sheep. To David, that would be the ultimate disaster for the sheep. They would be left without protection. They would be left without anyone to look after them. And so David did not put into this psalm what was true that a shepherd in his day and until the 1930s could be killed for looking after his sheep properly. And as late as 1930, H.V. Morton in his book In Search of the Master, oh sorry, in the, in the Footsteps of the Master, is it? In the Steps of the Master, thank you. In that book in the 1930s, he describes how they found a shepherd dead, battered, bleeding by his wandering sheep. Now, why didn't David include that? Well, because to say the shepherd would die would be to take the shepherd from the sheep. He didn't know what we know now. And so he couldn't put it in. But when Jesus came along, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. And the one thing a good shepherd does is to value the life of the sheep more than his own. He's willing to lay down his life for the sheep. And I will do that for you, he said. And he did. He told them he had many sheep to die for. He told his Jewish disciples he had other sheep which were not of this fold, referring to us Gentiles. And we've got to learn to get on together, Jew and Gentile, within the flock. But he said, for those other sheep, for you as well, I lay down my life and I take it up again. And so Jesus could include it, and he did. But you know, God, who saw it all and knew it all from the beginning to the end before he inspired David to write this psalm, edited David's psalms, and when he edited them, he put Psalm 23 right after Psalm 22. So God put it in if David didn't. And the fact is, you cannot come to Psalm 23 until you've been through Psalm 22. You can't have a shepherd until you've got a savior. You can't come under the crook until you've been under the cross. You can't be served by this savior until you've been saved by him. Let us pray. Father, the wonder of your word leaves us breathless. There's so much. And we pray that the same Holy Spirit who caused these words to be written and this song to be composed will not only help us to understand but to live and apply what we've learned. Lord Jesus, you're a good shepherd. We're sorry if we've let your reputation down. Use your crook on us. Get us back into the right track. For your name's sake. Amen.